Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have a, a, a sort of final session uh, with our, with, uh, on contract theory with the, uh, this year's uh, winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, Oliver Hart and Ben Holmstrom. Uh, we'll begin, uh, Bernard Salonier, who wrote the book on contract theory, is going, to, is going to do a brief introduction to our speakers. Then uh, we'll have Oliver speak, then Bent on reflections of, personal reflections, and then followed by um, Bob, uh, yeah, Bob Gibbons, and then Francine Lafontaine will sort of do sort of a discussion of where we're going to go from this work forward, followed by Oliver, who's going to talk, has some slides on, um, on what, on, on responses to their to their slides, and then uh, Bent will 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 sort of conclude the main body of the work. Then we'll follow that with uh, with some general discussion and Q and A. All right. So let me first introduce uh, Bernard Salonier, who's the uh, chair of the economics department, also secretary, I think, of the Econometric Society, a fellow of the Econometric Society, uh, and a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful chair. Thank you okay, so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a better empiricist, so I know I have to lower the mic. <laughs> so I'll speak first uh, very briefly as the chair of the economics department. It's an extreme pleasure to have all of you here. And in particular, we are honored by the presence of two giants of the field, Oliver Hart and Ben Thomstrom, in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> I want first, as the chair of the department, to remind you that we have an illustrious tradition in contract theory with names that maybe you wouldn't think of immediately. In the 1930s, Harold O'Telling was, in addition to working on exhaustible resources, on uh, the location model, and he was also setting the basis of what became optimal taxation. It's hidden somewhere in the 1932 Econometrica paper, which I encourage you to revisit. Then, slightly more recently, we had William Vickery, who, was, of course, is extremely famous for his contributions to the theory of auctions and also to urban economics, and who in 1945 again wrote a paper that maybe more people should read, that had the section three that basically sets out the models that would be solved by Merlis in 1971. More recently, um, I mean, more recently, we unfortunately, we had um, the passing of Ken Arrow, who also made extraordinary contributions to this field and in so many fields of economics that it would be even silly to try to enumerate them. And Ken's loss is felt very tragically by all of us. He was an alumni of Columbia, a student of Harold Hotelling, actually. And uh, we had a series of hours lecture, and Ken always came and had this always uh, smiling and ebullient personality with lots of very, very, um, very brilliant comments. And the last one was last October. We still have Joe Stiglitz, who unfortunately, in his very busy traveling calendar, couldn't be with us today. And some of us, um, at an early age for some, at a later age for others, were caught as, um, caught, as Bentley mentioned, textbookitis, which is deciding to spend a lot of your time writing textbooks. So I'll just, I'm just citing these two. So this one is the one I use when I teach contract theory. <laughs> <laughs> And this one is the one Patrick uses. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually not true. <laughs> and by the way, make sure you get the second edition. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to mention the forthcoming book by our, in French we would say, notre gentil organisateur. <laughs> A very nice organizer who, along with the staff at Columbia, has done a tremendous job organizing this conference. So make sure you don't miss this one. So that was me as the chair of the department. Now, I just want to speak extremely briefly on the evolution of the field. This perhaps illustrates already that we started with 
the first three chairs, uh, the first three presidents of the society, Ronald Coase, Oliver Williamson, and Douglas North. And now institutional economics is all over the place. You cannot read a development paper these days without reading about the role of institutions. In contract theory, we had frontier uh, research that was really high theory at the time in the 70s with the amazing contributions of Oliver and, um, and Bent in particular. And then we move to more applied theory and we move to empirical applications. And we have Bob Gibbons using contract theory in labor economics, as Bentley does. In organization economics, we have Francine Lafontaine using contract theory more in IO. Uh, I've been using it in application in insurance, for instance. We have the law school people who are using a lot of contract theory with their own approaches, but with a lot of interfertilization between our two fields. So it's a very exciting development. You can even go to microeconomic seminar, and a lot of what you will hear will be about models that 30 years ago, or maybe 40 years ago, would have been called contract theory. So it's wonderful to see this blossoming, and I'm very excited at um, the remarks and the Q&A in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we'll have Oliver, please. Uh, he needs no introduction. He's uh, the, uh, I guess I, I actually reminded one, I remember a story, I mean I can give you one story, of, of somebody in the, in the cemetery at Yale uh, at, in, at, in uh, New Haven, and the person has a tombstone with, with his whole CV, thousands and thousands of papers. <laughs> And then in the tombstone next, they had one citation, his, his main competitor at Yale. They both died together at Yale. His main competitor in the chemistry department has only one thing, Nobel Prize winner. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> so here I have Oliver Hart, Nobel Prize winner mm -hmm. in economic sciences. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I haven't yet started thinking about my gravestone, but maybe, <laughs> I guess it's, it's never, to, never too soon. Um, I'd like to thank Bentley for uh, putting together this panel, which, uh, or this session, which I, I'm looking forward to. I'm just going to say a few words about how I got into this. Um, uh, it's a very short story about it. I mean, basically, it was in, uh, it started in the summer of 1983, for me, uh, my work on incomplete contracts when I was sitting um, with Sanford Grossman in his uh, office at the University of Chicago and we were trying to think ab uh, about what to do next. We, we, you know, written a number of papers together and we rather quickly decided that the question of um, what determines whether a uh, two firms should write an arm's length contract with each other or do the transaction inside the firm was an interesting one. Uh, we knew, of course, that there was a literature on this. Uh, we were somewhat aware of the contributions of Coase and Williamson and others, although not extremely aware, which I think might have been an advantage. Um, what we did know is that um, there was really no formal modeling in this area, and we thought maybe we could um, do something useful along those lines, or at least we should try. And um, so we started thinking about the difference between firms and contracts. And we, our initial thought was that it had something to do with authority. So we started playing around with models where, you know, one party can choose the task of another party, so employer, employee, that sort of idea. Um, but we sort of hit a roadblock because at some point we realized what is the difference between that kind of authority and a requirements contract between two separate firms where you know they agree on a price quantity schedule and then the buyer chooses the quantity ex post and then the su supplier 
has to supply it and the, the, the price is according to the schedule that they'd agreed on. That sounds like, you know, you would say there the buyer has authority over quantity and yet that is a, an arm's length transaction. So we realized, well, it's going to be harder than we thought. Uh, then the next step was to realize, yeah, you can explain requirements contracts like that as being optimal if the buyer has some private information and that's why the quantity should vary. Um, but what happens if both parties have private information? So the buyer knows something about its, uh, his value, the no seller knows something about her cost, then the optimal contract isn't um, a contract where one party has authority over quantity, it's a mechanism where we both send in reports and uh, quantity depends on both of our reports and price depends on both of our reports. And, th and there you would say, neither party has authority over Q, the quantity traded, or both parties have, you know, are part of the input process. So that seemed more complicated and we've sort of struggled that, with that for a while. At some point, we, I think the sort of penny drop, we realized we were thinking about this the wrong way. We were thinking in terms of complete contracts and the right way to think about it was uh, in a situation where uh, the parties write an incomplete contract and there's stuff left out and then we realized a key question is who gets to decide on the things that are left out and that led us to the concept of residual control rights or residual decision rights and we realized that was a sort of interesting idea and that one could talk about the optimal allocation of those rights and one could think, in, um, think of firm boundaries in terms of the optimal allocation of residual control rights, and particularly the idea that the owner of an asset has residual control rights over that asset. And we, we can buy and sell assets, and that's how we transfer those rights. And also, that, that, that led us to the idea, which I um, elaborated on in my work with John Moore later, that um, there's an important distinction between human and non-human assets, because um, residual control rights over non-human assets can be traded, but uh, of course, absent slavery, you cannot trade um, human capital. So that distinction seemed important, and it was one that the previous literature hadn't really uh, talked about. So that's, that's basically how I got into it. So now we'll have our second Nobel Prize winner for 2017 in the Economic Sciences, Bent Holmstrom. So, thank you very much for inviting me, Bentley. And, uh, uh, and we were told with Oliver that we don't have to do any work. Uh, but uh, I can see that something has been renegotiated. Uh, 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 I want to say a few words also about how I got into this. Uh, and uh, a little unusual in that uh, I, w I actually didn't start off as an academic. I was an operations research uh, uh, graduate from in my undergraduate degree in mathematics, but operations research was the main field. And I was hired to do a corporate planning model in a big company in Finland, a conglomerate. And it was through, it was already halfway done. And, and as I was then applying my operations research and collecting data for, for this uh, pretty big model, we are talking about thousands of variables and five years of planning and hundreds of constraints. In those days, uh, it took a, a night to run one round of this, this program. I just came to the conclusion from talking to the people in the field going around in, in, the, in the company and, and trying to collect data that, you know, they were, ba they were basically playing games. You know, they, were, they wanted to know, uh, they were mystified by this model, they had never seen it. Uh, the, the, the bosses of the factories, most of these were factories, there were 30 factories. We are talking, by the way, about a billion dollar company at that time already big paper and pulp factory and all the possible other things that, uh, that uh, conglomerates did in those days. And they wanted, so though they were just interested in me telling them how they should play the game, uh, you know, in order to get the maximum amount of resources. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I went, I was working for the CFO, was, which was extraordinary for a 24 year old to be, you know, working with the second in charge at the company. Uh, gave tremendous insights into the company uh, and uh, to the business. I didn't know much about business before this. 
So that was extremely valuable, but this model, uh, within, I would say, four months or so, I went up to him and said, I think, I, I, I just think we shouldn't continue this project. And he thought that, uh, that I may not really be up to the task. Uh, but, but, so, but he was a, he was a great mentor, and he said, okay, I'm not going to force you to do this. I'm going to find something else for you to do, but uh, I'm not going to force you to do this. I believe that, I mean, he sort of bought into this understanding that this was uh, not just about running things uh, where you feed data. And so that got me into interested in incentives, and uh, I did what everybody who starts thinking about incentives is. I was starting to think about what kind of contracts should be designed so that these people play the game in the sort of most desirable way. And, uh, and uh, looking back at that, that part of my life, uh, I, I did all the errors one does when one starts doing incentives. And, uh, and uh, that is to believe that, that uh, you can, with financial contracting or uh, monetary incentives, get these people to behave correctly. Uh, I think today uh, it was very wrong-headed. This is inside the company. And, uh, but be that as it may be, I had some you know, models for allocating capital. Uh, that uh, I don't want to talk about anymore. But uh, the other thing I want to mention as a, as a sort of uh, very influential thing in my career has been to see that uh, the role of small models and that realizing that once you started doing small models for these people and explaining the logic of those models and how the, those models thought and interacting with these people and iterating around that is one factory at a time, not anymore about allocating resources, but helping them plan their own problem. That turned out to be very successful in the sense that they, they built up, they sort of were amazed that somebody, can, 24 year old, can come and ask for some numbers and then actually come pretty close to what they were doing after a few iterations. And so I used operations research very much like an economist. I used the model to get pretty close to where they were and then look at the shadow prices and then suggest that, are you really sure you want to do this? Because according to this model, you know the shadow price on this thing is actually pretty expensive. For instance, the glass factory, Itala, which many of you have drunk, almost all of you probably have drunk from a glass from Itala, a very famous factory. They thought the, the best product was uh, the artwork because it had a 90% markup on, the, what they, on their cost of, of, of work. And I concluded that was way too low and, uh, and explained to them why it was too low and how much these bottlenecks actually were worth and so on. And, and uh, it was interesting to see that that left an impression on them. So the reason I'm telling this story this far is that this idea of explaining the logic of the model and understand having this communication with the model and having the communication with the people who are meant to use the model has stayed with me throughout my career as have almost I mean at least half of what I've done has been always reflecting back on these two years at the company. The career concerns came from there just to give you an example because I saw how these People were playing the game of trying to impress the C CFO, and it was with me ever since. It's, uh, the delegation book is entirely from there. Uh, I would say moral hazard wasn't really on the agenda. I didn't think about that problem, but, uh, but a lot of these problems, needless to say, you know, the, the sort of mechanism design type setting, though I had no idea how to set up the mechanism design correctly. So if, uh, you know, Oliver told about that, that, that was my start, and, and it is still with me. And uh, reflecting, you know, uh, about, uh, as I will say a few words later, reflecting on where we are and, uh, and how, how, how to think about it. I'm always thinking, you know, how has it informed me, not just anymore about this company that was called Alstrom, incidentally. Uh, and, uh, but also the years I spent on boards of companies, I always think about the relevance. And I have a very, I'm going to speak about what I think is relevant. I have a particular view on empirical work that uh, is not probably going to be popular here, but uh, I will still express it because that's 
how I'm thinking about the empirical work. I think it's very challenging. But uh, seeing all this in the context of, of uh, the real world uh, that I have seen has been very important for me. Just last word, I mean, then I happened by accident to come to Stanford because Berkeley didn't accept me, thankfully, and uh, Stanford happened to be a place, and my first question was, uh, does anybody know anything about incentives? And uh, Wilson gave me, get, said, well, you should read this incentives in Teams paper by Gross, and I started reading it, and I read it and said, oh, you know, a couple of players, you know, N players, and I can't understand anything. This seems like cheap mathematics. And, uh, and I, I went back to integer programming for half a year. But then I finally started to begin to understand what the idea is about economic modeling. And thanks to Wilson and Joel Dembski and a lot of other great people at Stanford, so I was very lucky to come into the right place. It was a convergence of two accidents, uh, uh, positive accidents. So that's how I got into it. And then I met Oliver, and it was all over. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Bob Gibbons, the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management at MIT Sloan School of Management and Professor at MIT's Department of Economics. He's sort of a, a leading expert on, on contract theory and organization, and he has a beautiful book on, on orga organization, organizational economics with uh, John Roberts, and I'll let him take it over. Thank you, Bentley. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Francine and I are splitting this. I'm going to do things that are more related to the theory, and then we're lightly coordinated. She will turn to the empirics. Uh, one of the things that I like, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what Bank thinks about empirical work. One of the things I like about this conference is that it blends those two, and, and it blends some other things also that I think are important. So a little bit different than just straight up empirical work, I think there are a lot of people in this audience who are especially close to the phenomena of interest that really understand the institutional detail. I think that's important. And I also like very much that we have legal scholars and political scientists and, and that kind of blend as well. So I'm going to you know, try to bridge uh, those different audiences and interests here. Let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about three things. The first one is a little bit of what I think this uh, conference and, and society has been about and could be about. Uh, the second one in blue is about Oliver, and the third one in some kind of red there is about Banked. In the second and third parts, obviously, you know, some of you already know this work at least as well as I do. Others are maybe not interested in the full details, and so I'm just going to give a little flavor and try and move quickly towards talking about the opportunities. Uh, I do, though, think that, that there are you know, three different audiences here with um, three different messages I want to convey. So the, the first audience is Oliver and Banked, and my message is simple. It's thank you, and I'll, I'll go into that uh, in more detail. Um, and then I want to divide the rest of the room into, into two other audiences, those who attended this conference for the first time uh, only recently, like in the last five years, uh, versus those who have attended more than once from, let's say, 1997 to 2012. In fact, can I see a show of hands? How many people attended at least once between 1997 and 2012? Good. So my friend Paul Adler uh, at USC in the Marshall School at one point wrote, he's an organization theorist, fields that forget their forefathers are lost. Okay, and so, so my, my, the message I, I uh, mean to be delivering to the many of you who raised your hands is being in that uh, group that showed up before 2012 is, let's talk. Uh, and then the message to the people who didn't raise their hands, who are here only recently, is let's get going. There's lots to do. Okay? All right. Um, so to expand on the thank you, uh, and I'm a student of David Krebs's, and you can look on my website for my official thank you to David for everything that he did for me, um, uh, remarks I gave at his 65th birthday. I'm not a student directly of Oliver and Banked, but I'm equally grateful for the implicit and explicit mentoring they did for a long time. Um, I, I won't go through these in detail, but you know, I'll just pick out some. The, the left is sort of early career student days. You know, amusingly, given what the topic of, of all of this work is, Oliver taught me a class on imperfect competition in general equilibrium, which seems like it's a topic from Mars at this point. But um, 
But more importantly, in that year in Cambridge, England, Oliver invited me to a, I think it was a Monday evening theory supper, right? And there were Eric Maskin and Ken Binmore and Oliver and Frank Hahn. And, you know, I was 22 years old and utterly confused, but soaking stuff in, right? It was, it, thank you. It was fantastic. Jumping down to 86, uh, Banked was on sabbatical at Stanford. And I was there for the holidays, and he interrupted his holidays to talk to some kid that he'd never met before, and you know, told me that this Murphy guy would be an important guy to talk to, and that's been the longest-standing co-authorship in my in my career. So, you know, those kind of random acts of kindness. If you're if you're a mentor, uh, th th let me just tell you that, that that those had a big impact on me. Then over here on the right side, I see Berger Wernerfeld here. You know, we've been running the Organizational Economics Seminar in Cambridge since, I think, 94. I've been part of that with Berger and George Baker for 20 years. But we just couldn't have done it without Hart and Holmstrom. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, Banked and I taught a bunch of things together and created new courses. The NBER group wouldn't have happened without them. I spent one of the best years of my life uh, visiting the Harvard Economics Department and got basically 15 one-on-one -on -one lunches with Oliver Hart and, you know, changed the way I think about a whole lot of things. So, okay, that's the thank you. Uh, so here we are. Um, I, I find myself about ready to give back my union card as an economist because I really am utterly bored with markets. I, I want to be about things other than markets. I, th I think that an enormous amount of economic value is created outside of markets. And taking a page from Avinash Dixit, who said, when a term has become a buzzword, you can give it any definition you want. So I'm going to take the word governance, which other people use for related ideas, and say, this is governance. What, the way we think about increasing the economic value that's created outside the market mechanism, let's call those governance problems. And we'll talk about organizations and contracts and institutions. Um, relative to the word institutions, you'll notice that I'm, I'm missing one picture here, uh, Doug Norris. So that, that would be a capital I institution. I'm going to be talking about small I institutions as we go along. But everything that I've learned from, from these five is what I mean to be thinking about in these orange slides that come next here. So, to put that another way, you know, the black stuff on the left, I just don't have enough room to think about anymore, and the orange stuff on the right uh, fascinate me. <laughs> so then there's that mixed color thing in the middle, and uh, Banked and I are colleagues with Parag Pathak, who's a student of Al Roth, and Al Roth, of course, coined the term market design, and every time I see Parag, I say, what's so market about market design, right? You know, it's an allocation mechanism. Committees, dictators, we've got lots of allocations. So, you know, I, I think we, we see, we talk and maybe think we see markets where I'm not sure they are. So I want to focus on the, on the right side here. I want to think about how much economic value is created outside the market mechanism. Of course, that might be inside a firm or various other organizations, hospitals, schools, government agencies. Moving to the left, it might be in settings that I'll call organized rather than organizations. And so that would include some kinds of contracts and communities and small i institutions. So a, a way to put uh, that uh, left orange column is to say non-integration, the fact that you and I are not in the same firm, isn't always the market mechanism. By the way, these slides, like the Kreps thing, will be on my website if you prefer to not take pictures, but however you prefer. Okay, so just to talk about a little bit some of these things that I mean by institutions, I, and I don't mean that the, you know, Hart Holmstrom Williamson work was only about organizations, I don't mean that the Alchin Demsitz Klein work was only about contracts, but I mean to be surfacing work like Aoki Dixit Greif Ostrom on things like, you know, there's Bob Ellickson on those farmers, cattle ranchers in Shasta County, right? And, and importantly, they're not trading cattle with each other. If, if they're trading anything, it's something like fence maintenance or something, and there isn't a market for that, right? So this is a community, and it's creating economic value, right? And it's not a market. Likewise, you know, I uh, had the good fortune to be in Stockholm for December 2009, and I, you know, I knew that I had learned a lot from Oliver Williamson, and I walked out of there thinking, wow, do I have a lot to learn from the collected works of Eleanor Ostrom about how to build and manage relational contracts, which I take to be fundamental to all this stuff. Okay, so um, that's the domain. 
And, and I, I don't mean that that's the only set of things that CO could be thinking about, but I think there is a lot to think about there that CO is well positioned to think about, including from law and political science. Let me turn to, to Oliver's part here. Um, I'll do three quick topics. The first one is lateral integration. Actually, there, there are three points here. So I guess the first one's already been made. Sandy Grossman used to be an academic, so there's point one. Point two is that Oliver Hart did lots of his best work at MIT. I like making that point. Point three is, point three is that they had the foresight to put the word lateral in here. Okay, and why is that interesting? And here, uh, not only did we coordinate, but I think Francine saved a slide when she saw that I was going to put this slide up. Right. So many of you will know the recent paper by Adelaide Hortaksu and Severson that says, "Wow, firms that own an upstream plant and a downstream plant typically ship nothing from the upstream plant to any other zip code where they own a plant. Forget about the downstream plant." Okay, so that you know, if you if you walk into this literature thinking that you're looking at vertical product flow all the time, you better rethink. Why might then a firm own an upstream plant and a downstream plant? It's for reasons more like corporate strategy. You know, corporate strategy is the question: Why are we in? Why is Dupont in chemical and rubber and explosives, right? Why are you in horizontally or laterally related businesses? And so, what looks like vertical ought to be construed as, as perhaps lateral in, in their treatment. Here, um, on the left, I have these figures from Alonzo desain Matushek and Heike Rantakari in 2008 that talk about not so much, let's see if I can make the pointer work here. There we go. Um, these, this analysis is trying to organize two different businesses here called I and J, and perhaps with the, uh, some activity by a headquarters or a top manager, M. And so there are various different structures. These papers are talking about how do you organize the businesses you have, but there could also be some discussion about, you know, should we add a business K, right? And so th that's what these corporate strategy ideas are, are about, and this is the kind of modeling that, that one can pursue. I'll, I'll come back to these questions later. I think an, another example of something that's like lateral integration is some wonderful work that's been presented at least once, maybe, maybe multiple times. I don't know if Claude or Emmanuel are here. I haven't seen them. But um, you know, I've certainly seen different renditions of this and loved it every time. Um, this is about, um, I'll get this wrong. Someone from Paris can fix me up later. But uh, you know, fancy flour going into particular um, patisserie. And, the, there are 40 millers who make this fancy flour for, for French baked goods. And originally, they're separate firms. So there is nothing called a strategic center. And so green is non-integration. They could have all merged. And so they'd be divisions, these separate millers. And the acquiring entity would maybe not be called a strategic center. It'd be called a headquarters, perhaps. But what they actually did was put some of their assets and some of their decision rights and some of their payoff rights into something called a strategic center, but they retained independent firms below that. And so you could think of lots of other so-called hybrid organizational forms like co-ops and franchising and inside contracting, but I, I think all of this stuff is um, very, very interesting and much more prevalent than we've yet analyzed. Okay. The second thing I want to say about um, the property rights work is, you know, we call this incomplete contracting, but I think there's some very, uh, correctly, uh, but I think there's some very interesting work that you might call incomplete bargaining, right? So let me point out that there are two moments in the timeline of this model where the simplest model has assumed perfect bargaining, like Cozian bargaining or Nash bargaining or Shapley bargaining, that kind of perfect bargaining. So one is up here at the uh, original moment where they bargain over uh, the ownership structure. For example, should we be integrated or non-integrated? And they get to the efficient frontier there. And the other is ex post. And this is, of course, where you can tell the difference between a property rights model a la Grossman Hart versus a Williamsonian ex post haggling model. Uh, again, you know, for convenience, actually, Oliver at one point pulled out of his drawer a working paper version of Grossman Hart that had imperfect bargaining here in stage four. But anyway, the published version has uh, perfect bargaining here. And so I now want to just talk about two recent papers that explore imperfect bargaining at those two stages and I think open up very interesting new ideas. So one of them is a paper by Joshua Gans in the RAND where he says, 
let me have imperfect bargaining at the start. And he says, instead of Nash or Shapley, let's have an auction. But uh, there are three, um, three parties here. Parties one and two do have specific investments or ex ante actions. Party three does not, right? So the first thing that Grossman Hart Moore would tell us is, why would you ever give ownership to party three? They don't have any incentives that you're trying to manage here. Uh, so what Gans does is he says, well, let's have an auction, but only individuals can bid. And what he shows is there can be situations where party three can outbid party one, and party three can outbid party two. So party three will win the auction. Why is that different than what Grossman Hart would have told you? Ah, because Grossman Hart would have let parties one and two get together to, to outbid party three. Okay, so, so if you think that you can't form those coalitions in the ex-ante bargaining, you might get ownership by a party who's not investing, huh, that starts to look like a shareholder. Okay, so I just point out that you could get interesting ideas by incomplete bargaining there, and likewise you can get interesting ideas by incomplete bargaining at the other end. So Le Shui Ha uh, has a recent Jibo paper where he says, again, let there be three parties, let's call them Grossman, Hart, and Moore, and there are two assets, and let's say that Grossman owns one asset and Hart owns the second asset. Question, who does Moore work for, if anyone? Model utterly silent on that question. Le Shui Ha talks about changing the bargaining, analyzes using a paper by Meyerson about incomplete uh, bargaining on incomplete networks, and says, let's suppose that John Moore works for Oliver Hart. And now when it comes to the Shapley bargaining at the end of the model, John Moore can't walk into that Shapley bargaining room and grab anything for himself or bargain with Sandy Grossman. John Moore can only bargain when Oliver's in there directing him. Okay, so it's, it, John Moore has become an employee in the sense that he can't bargain without his boss's presence. He can't sell assets of the firm to, to Grossman Enterprises, for example, right? And the, the conclusion that is reached in this paper is not only might you like to have Moore be an employee for some parameters, for other parameters, he should be his own assetless firm. He should be a professional services firm or something. Uh, not only might you use this idea of bossness or employeeness, but you also might have different uh, asset allocations than you would in the Grossman Hart Moore model. Okay, and so I think you know, th those are big open areas to, to change those two bargaining uh, structures. Okay, last thing, and this is maybe closest to, uh, to this society. Uh, I'll get to contract law here, but the, the points I wanna make are, first of all, I don't think we have a sharp enough understanding about the difference between delegation on the one hand versus non-integration on the other. And so these models um, talk about, you know, you'll notice that there's no um, headquarters top manager in these two pictures, and so they're referred to as decentralization. Uh, this one on the upper left here is, is uh, I takes I's decision and J takes uh, the decision for, for J's market. Um, how do you know whether that picture is non-integration or delegation by the headquarters capital M to those two units inside? Putting it differently, you know, I think it's quite clear in the world that non-integration is different from integration where we give control to the center, is different from integration where we delegate to some internal actor. And so we can't have a model that has only two choices to represent a world that has three outcomes. And so it's, it's a little bit of a slippery slope that uh, professors Agion and Tirol have launched us on here to repurpose the Grossman Hart model to analyze this distinction between centralization and delegation inside using the same model as we use on other occasions to explain the difference between non-integration and integration, right? This, this can't work. So there's work to be done there. Similarly, uh, I think given time, I'll, I'll skip over a, a parallel problem also launched by Aguillon Tirol. A lot of slippery slopes here uh, asking, so you know, is the Grossman Hart model better as a distinction between integration versus non-integration or a distinction between integration versus moving control rights by contract? Again, there are three governance structures we see in the world. The model has two. We're missing something. 
down to contract law, uh, what's the difference between a division and a subsidiary? And lastly, uh, like Paul Adler and those who forget their forefathers are lost, I think one of the most important ideas I ever heard from Oliver Williamson was the idea that contract law might differ under integration than it does under non-integration, right? The set of fees, and, and that's just not the way the literature, the formal literature has gone. I think this idea of forbearance is potentially very, very important. Okay, all right, Bengt, here we go. Um, so, so um, I, I'm going to blame my supervisor who didn't give me any feedback. Uh, so, so uh, many of you will know these equations. These are Holmstrom models from the 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, this is what I learned in graduate school, and it had all kinds of implications for um, accounting and performance measures and, and various other things. Uh, and um, this is, of course, agency theory, and many of you will know that that's different from property rights and transaction costs, okay? And indeed, Scott Maston and Stefan Saussier have a paper uh, talking about the difference between agency and transaction costs. What I want to say here is a set of things about uh, don't give up on agency too quickly, and then I will be done. So, so the first thing that Bank started doing in the 90s, as some of you will know, is still continuing to think about agency, but with more instruments. So not just contracts, as we had in A, but more instruments like job design, and here in uh, two papers with Milgram, in, in this one, not just incentives, but also controls. Asset returns, once you start talking about assets, you think, gee, have we gotten to the firm boundary? And, and I think you know a, a paper that really has an enormous amount of gas left in the tank, a lot of things that need to be explored further, uh, the sub-economy paper in, in 99, as I'll show in a second, takes you all the way to thinking about boundaries via agency. But while we're on boundaries, the review paper with John Roberts uh, in the JEP makes the points that incentives for specific investments are determined by more than ownership, and it also says ownership determines more than specific investments. Here I particularly like the Influence Activities work by Milgram and Roberts and Meyer Milgram and Roberts and Mike Powell has a recent J. Leo paper along this line. I think there's lots more to do there. Uh, while you're thinking about agency models, however, something that's in the sub-economy paper says, look, an agent who's taking two kinds of actions, some of which are helpful to firm one and others of which are helpful to firm two, could be standing in a common agency relationship or could be employed by firm one who the, and firm two then contracts with firm one, right? And so we have a rich set of possible models of integration and, and governance structures strictly from an agency perspective. Okay, so to end, um, this might be, you know, these particular glasses uh, trying to read into where I hope Banked uh, would like us to go. Uh, what I, what I what I take from the sub-economy idea is not that you take a transaction out of the market in order to replicate a market. No, the whole point of the sub-economy paper is you take a transaction out of the market in order to build a set of rules internally that work better um, than they um, would in the market. And so um, the way I would summarize some of this is interests are everywhere. Pay for performance is not. It, it might not even be that internally you have pay for performance. And there's a beautiful paper by Alessandro Bonatti and Heike Rantakari in 16 about the politics of compromise along this line. Similarly, you might move beyond formal instruments. You might still have incentive plans, Bentley and Jim Malcolmson, John Levin, and so on. But I think even more important, I think there, you know, the idea of empowerment, I think, is more consequential for thinking about interests in organizations than pay for performance is. And I don't think it's limited to inside the organization. And there are beautiful papers by Simon Board and Isaiah Andrews and, and Dan Barron along that line. So I'll, I'll end, uh, one minute over, apologies, by saying, could it be that you know, we get to culture, we get to leadership, and what leaders do is build equilibria here? Francine, thank you. I was so fascinated by, by his discussion, I was just in, in rap paying rapt attention. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. And in fact, I'm sort of overwhelmed by how much work we have left to do. I mean, he's provided us a lot of issues. So next we'll have Francine Lafontaine, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Research and the William Davidson Professor of Business and Economics and Public Policy at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. I should also mention, we, uh, Francine and I have faced a similar kind of problem. Come on up, Francine. Come on up. Come on. 
We both went to University of British Columbia. You might not, might not have heard of that place, but those of us have both experienced that here in the U.S. where, you know, Stanford, all these, you know, Princeton, Harvard, we come in and, and you go to these conferences and say, where did you come from? Well, I went to University of British Columbia. Where's that? Canada, where is that? And especially nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, it's wonderful to be able to introduce Francine, who's done really important uh, empirical work. She's a real leader in the area who comes from that own unknown place in, in, in the north. Yes, the and great so, white north. The great white north, so please. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to start by thanking Bentley for organizing this session and all the participants for being part of it and all of you for staying uh, and being with us this afternoon. It's great to, uh, well, not quite afternoon, I guess. It's great to see you all. Um, as uh, Bob mentioned, we're, we, we divided and conquered uh, by having him specialize in uh, the theory side, which he is well known for, and, and me going towards more of the empirical side. Um, given that uh, I have only the 20 minutes, it's going to be a very high level discussion of some of the empirical work that's been done in relation to all of these models. So please don't take offense if I don't mention something you did and stuff like that. I'm going to be uh, very much at the 30,000 foot high level. But I'm also going to um, you know, what my goal is to, is, is to try and emphasize the enormous amount of empirical work that has um, been built up or, or that has explored different aspects of, um, you know, implications and, and parts of the theories that Bengt and Oliver have provided us with. And I'm going to do that by just, as I said, a brief overview, and then after that, spending most of my time on discussing a little bit of some of the opportunities I see out there. Um, and there are many, so that also is going to be very broad. Um, so, but because of where I am from, which is I.O., um, my focus is going to be not so much on things that Bernard has, for example, very well highlighted in his book um, in terms of empirical work on, on employment contracts, including executive compensation and career concern type of work and all of that. Um, there's also, you know, in, in the description of the Nobel Prize for both Bank and Oliver, there's descriptions of, of work in financial contracts for Oliver in particular and uh, choice between public and private provision. But given my, my I.O. background, I'm going to be thinking more about where is it that their work has influenced um, I.O. empirical work, contracts between firms, how firms, uh, the boundaries of the firms and how firms interact. So I'll be talking about, as I said, the boundaries of the firm, how we think about that, about inter-firm contracts and um, thinking about where we find data that would allow us to do some empirical work that makes progress on some of these issues. Um, so I hope that these, you know, are going to inspire you, all of you, to think about uh, various settings where you could apply some of the ideas that come from this important uh, set of work. So the flavor part. Uh, this is my slide on agency theory. Um, so mostly what I want to say is that, you know, there's been a lot of work on executive compensation and sales force compensation, um, and people have talked a lot about it, but in inter-firm contracts, incentives matter too. And so there's been work done for that, and, and that's what I'll, um, I want to mention here. And in particular, it's um, work on the choice of contract between share, fixed wage, fixed fees. These are different ways of organizing transactions between firms as well, and um, things that relate to the, rela the, the characteristics of the transaction, so how we relate these choices to these characteristics. And the empirical literature has found a lot of support for implications from agency theory and models uh, in explaining things like franchise contracts and technology licensing contracts and commercial leasing contracts, the kind of hybrids that in part, Bob was talking about. And then multitasking ideas are really helpful to shed light on the fact that we have some components of the contract that might focus on incentives, but we also have other components 
that try to fix the result of having put incentives in a particular place uh, in these contracts. So um, there are lots of ideas to use in terms of trying to understand procurement contracts and, and other types of firms in firm interactions that are often fairly complex and detailed. Incomplete contract theory helps us a lot on the boundaries of the firm. So, uh, for example, even the decision to franchise particular stores versus not, you can see the importance of the agent's effort and in, in building the business. So I'm not going to call that human capital because you can actually sell what you've built once you've done that. So it's, but it is an effort component that um, takes the form of an intangible at some point. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is, when I started doing work on franchising, people would say to me, well, why can't the firm devise an incentive contract with just residual claims and, and that kind of stuff that would give the kind of incentives that they want? Why do they go all the way to a form of ownership of the store? And the reason is that that makes the person willing to invest in building that store and that brand in that location. So the ownership of the stream of profits, or at least over a period of time, is important for that. Um, and I mentioned this paper also about um, franchisee initial investment requirements as an incentive mechanism. So asset ownership and allocation of decision rights, there's, uh, they open up a lot of different kinds of questions that contracts are um, between firms uh, can be explained by. All right. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about the empirical literature, kind of what it's done, in the sense of saying the bulk of the literature has been about incidents. Where do we see particular types of contracts come up? Where do we see contract clauses? Under what circumstances? There's a bit more stuff that's been going on on effects over the last little while, and those are important. Ultimately, we want to know whether the right choice of organization also yields, you know, benefits that we can quantify. Um, one thing that has not happened a lot in OrgEcon is to think about policy stuff. And I'm going to argue that we need to think a little bit more about that. So Duncan kind of went into policy a little bit yesterday as well. I think that um, both explaining where it makes sense for contract clauses or types of contracts to arise and when, uh, what kind of effects these have. Um, all of that is very relevant for things like antitrust. That's very clear in I.O. because we've got the vertical restraints literature and stuff. But also consumer protection type policies and transfer pricing and taxes and other things like that. So there's work both in terms of using policy as a way to, for us to identify certain things, but also to inform policy that I think um, we could be more explicit about. I think it's in there in some of the empirical work and some of the theory, but we, we're not as explicit about it as I think is worth doing. Um, okay, so some of the things that have constrained empirical work is kind of what kind of data, what kind of context do you need and, and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about, number one, you have to have a dependent variable that you can measure. And that dependent variable has tended for incidents to be, you know, do we observe this or not? Um, so an organizational feature of some sort, vertical integration would be one of them. There's always the question of what's the alternative? So we can say whether something is vertically integrated in some cases, but is the alternative the market or is the alternative uh, the, a contract of some sort? And the implications are a little bit different. You need to think through them. Uh, when it comes to these different um, alternatives. And even vertical integration, it's not always so easy to define whether things are vertical or not. Um, people use input-output matrices in some types of work. I'm, you know, I hesitate a little bit about that. Um, there are contexts where it's easy to measure, and that, that's part of why these contacts have received more attention. So franchising was one of those things where it was pretty clear whether something was vertically integrated or not. Trucking, Baker and, and Hubbard have done, written many papers and, and other people in the room where, you know, whether the shipper owns a trucking capability or whether they outsource that or whether the 
truck driver owns the truck or not. So there are things where it's very clear how to do that. Forbes and Letterman in airlines with majors and regionals is another example. But there are other cases where it's much fuzzier and you have to think about, okay, so they procure 10%, is that vertically integrated or not? And back to Atelier and, and that work. Um, having more context where we can clearly define things or thinking about pushing on that, I think would be important. Um, in contracting, you know, trying to put together what are the important features of the contracts and, and having a, a sense of the whole set of contract clauses also, also uh, becomes complicated. But that's the kind of work, that, that's the starting point. You need some dependent variable that's an organizational feature. And then you need to think about what explains it. And that's where things are even tougher. Um, in these theories, we have guidance as to, you know, certain types of phenomena matter. So for example, um, in the work on vertical integration by uh, Silky and, and Mara in airlines, they need variation in the need for adaptation in these relationships. So they do measure that with weather disruptions, which is a good matching of the concept and, and the measure. But there's not a lot of context where you have these kinds of very good matches or, or you can find good ways to do that. They also look at bad adaptation decisions, how costly these are, and they measure that by the importance of that particular route in the network of the airline. which. So thinking through, you know, how to best approach these independent variables is actually very, imp I've had lots of people come to me and say, I have data on these contracts and I know what, you know, my dependent variable looks like. And I keep saying, okay, so what explains it? What's on the right hand side? Um, what do you know about, it, about that? So in franchising, trying to measure the importance of agent effort, you use things like labor to capital ratio because locally the store owner manages the labor, um, in licensing contracts, where are we in the technology development, things like that. Um, thinking of, you know, pushing on these kinds of things is, I think, really important. There's other issues that come up when you do work on incidents. Um, among other things, the characteristics of the things that are organized one way versus another way. Um, they're endogenous as well. There's matching that's going on. There's all sorts of uh, issues about about using these characteristics on the right hand side. Then there's also interactions between some of these in characteristics according to the theory, so you need to think about those. And then there's um, the fact that lot you know a contract is a lot of contract clauses all at once. And uh, thinking about which ones are the most important to focus on empirically and and thinking about how they relate to each other. One of the suggestions that Margaret and I put forward was to think about, okay, certain, you know, the legal system helps us in that. They, they have these templates and there are certain types of contracts and maybe a type of contract is a set of characteristics. We can look within that set, but we can also use the set as a, a, a set of contract terms that can be studied together. So um, having said all that about the work on incidents, when it comes to looking at effects, we have even further difficulties. You need to find something that is organized differently, and yet it's the same transaction, more or less, and you have to have a performance measure that relates to that uh, relationship. So, um, so that's not always an easy type of thing to find, and then the big empirical issue becomes also that organizational choice is endogenous. So having said that, people are making progress with kind of instrumental variable approaches. Uh, the second two papers on here really do use an instrumental variable approach. The first one uh, is kind of a two-step approach in, in that spirit. Um, but you know, people are thinking more about ways to identify the effect of these uh, organizations and um, I, I would encourage you to, uh, to look into those. And again, apologies for anyone that's not on the list. I can't fit that many papers on there. So um, I'm going to move on to talk about opportunities at this point. So the first I thing I'm going to talk about is basically methodologies and a bit of data. Um, policy, policy changes 
are one way that people have been identifying effects in this literature through um, policy changes being somewhat exogenous. In some cases, you can't argue that, but in other cases, it's more doable. And so um, natural experiments is something that's been growing in this literature and that um, is very uh, helpful for us. So here are a few examples in different kinds of contexts. And um, what you need to look for is exogenous factors that are affecting the decisions. As I said, policy can be useful, but sometimes business cycle in the, f the work on airlines, weather matters in uh, Machiave Machiavello and Morgaria, they use supply shocks that are exogenous to the firm, so different things like that. And kind of connected to some of what Banks said, a partnership, one way of, of making progress on some of this type of work is to partner with firms that have issues that they're trying to understand. So, um, you know, during a period of exogenous shock in particular, you can get really great information and, and that's really a, a good way to go if you can convince them. And by the way, it's easier to convince firms in other countries than in the US, just in case um, <laughs> that might be useful. Um, so we have a lot of examples of that on the program. We also have a little bit of structural work. It's much more on the I.O. side, but it is becoming, becoming something that people um, are doing more in labor and in other contexts. And that gives you a capacity to simulate what might be the effect of, of cer certain changes and so quantify certain things. So I encourage you to think about those as well. And then following Duncan from yesterday, I want to mention online online business and its growth and the markets there as, as a data source. There are lots of ways in which these online platforms are organizing their business and lots of interesting questions and they actually experiment so you can learn from their experimentations. And this is an example from a grad student of mine who's collected data from a website who's writing contracts with hospitals in China to put them on a website that tells potential customers Okay, tells potential customers um, what kind of services they provide, basically uh, uh, health exams. And what these data are is the discount rate that the hospital gives to the website. So it's basically what the website is going to earn as a proportion of what the hospital charges the people that it sends to these hospitals. And the interesting thing is that like more than 10%, like 12% of them, are at zero, which is not the most profitable contract term you can think of. And then we have other ones that are at 0.6 and 0.7, which is unbelievable. So are these mistakes, maybe? Are these, uh, they're not data mistakes. I, I did have her check that. She has the contracts. So, um, so the question is, how do we think about this? And these firms, again, are experimenting, so maybe uh, we, we can, particularly learn about their process and, and why they might do this. There might be characteristics of hospitals that explain this, but we're searching for that. Huge variation is really a good thing in, in terms of, uh, you know, it, it's weird, but it's useful empirically. So I just spent some time at the FTC as the chief economist there, and um, I learned about markets I never knew existed. So in particular, uh, I think that in the supply chain and in the reaching markets um, of part of how firms function, there are lots of possibilities, lots of industries that are in these intermediary roles that we don't study as much as we, th we should. Um, decisions are not to, to internalize some of these functions raise interesting questions. Also, the contracts they write are really kind of complicated and interesting. So lots of opportunities there. I'm going to give you an example. I just wrote a short summary of a merger case in something called the pharmacy benefit management industry, which, again, I didn't know existed. Um, these are firms that manage the pharmacy benefit plan that's attached to your health plan. So the plan sponsor is, a ho is your employer in the U.S. or an insurance company. And these companies, what they do is they work with the pharmacy to tell the pharmacy when you go as a customer to fill a, a prescription, they tell that pharmacy how much to charge to you at that point and um, 
what kind of conditions uh, are attached to the prices and stuff. But they also design formularies. They say which drugs are going to be put in which tiers of reimbursement and stuff. They negotiate contracts with uh, branded drug manufacturers. They do all sorts of things that you know are in the background. And so thinking about the role of these intermediaries, why this is delegated, the number of contracts, all these types of things, there are lots of interesting things to do there. I have another example here having to do with multi-level marketing. I'm going to skip that, but you know, why does this exist? Why do firms reach markets this way? Is another interesting set of questions. And you know, across beside I/O, people are looking at what firms do in lots of other fields in economics. And I just gave a f and and in contract sense. So I just wanted to give a, a feel for uh, a few examples across these different areas. So the last thing I'll say, and I won't go through the slides because um, I'm already out of time, but the work that we do also can inform policy. And so, um, you know, there is this in, in hospitality tradition that we've learned from, from Williamson a while back, which is that sometimes people, when they see a particular practice by a firm, they are dubious as to why the firm is doing that. If we can explain the, re, you know, the use of different types of contracts and stuff, that's worth a lot from a policy perspective. And it's important to do this right if there are efficiency benefits from organization. So I'm going to leave that last slide. You know, it's just about how to think about also how policies sometimes make firms do things away from optimal. Um, and that's something else that we could inform uh, policies for. This is an example from a paper of colleagues at the FTC, and it shows that when hospitals merge with physician practices, what you see is a big decrease in how many claims the physicians are making, the, uh, the physicians' offices are making to get reimbursement in terms of uh, visits to offices. And the reason for that big decline is fundamentally not, you know, that they integrated for great purposes, they vertically integrate in this case because if you have the hospital claim the visit as opposed to having the doctor's patient do that, um, the way that the regulation is set up, you make more money with the hospital claim. So um, the incentives are just messed up by that. So in sum, I think that there's a lot of great work that we can be doing on the theory side as well as on the empirical side. And I'm just going to uh, congratulate our two uh, Nobel Prize winners here today for helping us along the way. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks. How do you respond to those very interesting uh, presentations by Bob and Francine? Um, I mean, I thought it would be difficult to anticipate. I didn't quite know what they were going to say. So I thought I would prepare my own remarks, which I think are complementary uh, to what they were saying. Um, so I just found it useful to think a bit about um, what I believe we know in the incomplete contracting area and what, what we still don't. So, okay, so I think we know that contractual incompleteness is important in reality. Uh, people are not able to write highly complete contracts in a lot of interesting situations. And therefore, uh, residual control rights and residual decision rights matter, and presumably, therefore, their allocation matters. So, you know, at some high level, I think we know those things. I think one place where we can see this, um, and, and Bengt uh, alluded to this, is in the context of venture capital and startups, uh, where you have the, the venture capitalist, the investor, who wants control in order to get their money back. Um, but entrepreneurs want control too. Um, perhaps, and I'll come back to this, to pursue their dreams and not get replaced too easily, although this didn't seem to have helped uh, Travis Kalanick. This seemed to be an interesting case where, as far as I, I could understand, just from reading the newspapers, he actually had control, but he was still persuaded to resign. Um, but anyway, this, uh, so the question is, how do you, um, how do you deal with this trade-off? They each want control. 
Um, and you, you see in practice arrangements of some sort of divided control and also contingent control, control shifting backwards and forwards. Uh, and, of course, uh, there's a, a famous paper by Aguillon and Bolton on this, and Kaplan and Stromberg have done some very important empirical work in that area. Um, I think we also know that, at least in some situations, the distinction between... Um, Non-human and human assets matters. I was talking about that earlier, that you can um, transfer the residual control rights over the, the first and not the second. Um, this seems to matter particularly in young companies. I think there's been some interesting work uh, started by Kaplan, Sensoy, and Stromberg uh, about whether it, uh, in their paper which starts off, in the title starts off, is it the jockey or the horse? So the question is, in these um, startups, um, what is more important, the, the human capital, the person who comes with the idea or the idea itself? And they argue, actually, the idea is pretty important, that you can often replace the um, human capital. But then, uh, you know, it's not a... Comp I think we, we don't... The, the, the uh, evidence... Uh, you know, there's also counter evidence. Bernstein, Kortewege, and Law have a paper which, uh, in which they argue that actually the human characteristics of the, 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 the qualities of the person with the idea, uh, that's very important to the venture capitalists. And I think uh, Raghu Rajan has an interesting, um, his presidential address to the American Finance Association was how one can see... Um, how firms progress over time from a situation where human capital may be very important, a particular person, but then over time um, things are standardized in the firm and part of what allows a firm to later go public and become a big firm is that nobody's human capital is that important um, anymore. Um, and, you know, this also helps us to understand what is a firm, you know, which is a very complicated question, I think. But it's quite useful to think about this um, in the context of small of companies which are just emerging, because there you can sort of perhaps see more clearly whether it's the human capital or the, uh, or the idea um, which really creates the value. Later on, it may be much more complicated. Uh, um, and, and, as I say, human... Uh, People may, there may not be any key human um, assets anymore. Okay, so I think we've made progress on these things. Things where I think um, we still don't know a lot. Uh, we don't, and this is very disappointing to me in a way, uh, given where I started with, San, with Sandy Grossman, we thought we would develop a formal theory of contractual incompleteness, but I don't think we, we, we ever got there because, um, you know, we have, and you're probably aware of this, this sort of mask and tarot critique, that basically, um, even though you can't foresee the future very well, there are all these, uh, there are these weird mechanisms you could uh, write into the contract which would allow people later on to... Uh, pool their whatever common information they have and essentially make the contract complete as if, uh, you know, they could complete it from the beginning. Um, we don't see those mechanisms. I don't think we have a good theory as to why we don't see them. We don't even see um, simpler... Whoops. Oh. Uh, that's all right. Simpler things like, you know, the, the hold-up problem, which is, of course... Um, been extremely important in the theoretical development of this area. I mean, people have really focused on this problem, uh, including myself, uh, of trying to um, encourage people to make ex-ante investments. Um, but, you know, one way to solve that problem, at least if one of, only one of us is investing, is to have that party uh, be allocated all the bargaining power. The contract simply say... Will, says, I will make a take it or leave it offer to you. So that isn't a very complicated mechanism. It doesn't sound so weird. And yet, I don't think we see those uh, contracts either. So why is that? Why don't we see these things? I, I don't think that we can explain uh, why we don't if we stick to the assumption that people are fully rational and also fully self-interested. I think we have to depart from those assumptions, which some people don't want to do. Uh, probably not in this, this crowd may not mind so much, but I think if you take a standard theory crowd, they're not so keen on 
on, on giving up on, on the classical assumptions. In my own work on contracts as reference points, I've gone down the road of saying that people, um, even firms, which, uh, you know, our firm's people, you know, uh, Mitt Romney thought so. Uh, uh, certainly people seem to be important in firms. So I think firms aren't utterly different from ordinary people. And even for them, um, fairness or reasonable outcomes matter. And I think you can make some progress uh, by building in those kinds of things. But it's still uh, somewhat controversial. Not everyone you know, likes this sort of approach, but I think it may be a useful way forward. Let me just end. Uh, so here's another set of things, now more down to earth, not about foundations, but uh, things I think we still could understand better. So, uh, of course, um, so my work is really, with co-authors, is based on this idea of control mattering. But I'm not sure we really understand that well why control is important to people. So I mentioned the um, entrepreneur who wants control in order to pursue his or her vision. So that might be this one. Uh, they don't want to be replaced. But why don't they want to be replaced? I mean, is it because of some sort of private benefit they get from uh, being the CEO of the company? Um, is, it, is it a monetary benefit? Or is it a psychic benefit? Um, is it a kind of ego thing? Um, is it, uh, do people, want or should get control because of these relationship-specific investments they're meant to be making, and they'll be held up if they don't have it? Is it that? I'm not sure it's that. I mean, our models often have that as the key feature, but I'm not sure that's really so important in reality. Um, you know, is it that? Is it private benefits? Is it some sort of... Um, vision thing, or is it, you know, even, um, so let me put this one down, um, is it a sort of non-instrumental reason? That is to say, um, if you were running an enterprise, you know, suppose I found an enterprise, but then somehow I cede control to you, uh, but you happen, we happen to agree on everything. So, you know, you're just going, it's banked. Banked and I see eye to eye on many things. He's going to do the kinds of things I would do anyway. Is that going to be enough for me? Um, if the thing is a great success, will I be able to say, oh, well, you know, he implemented my ideas anyway, so I should get the credit for the success? Or am I going to think, well, it wasn't really ultimately me, it was him, and so I have to share the success with him? I mean, these, I think this gets into psychological issues because it's, it's not really about conflicts of interest. It's what you take credit for, and it may not be about the monetary return. So I think there's a lot about why control is important to people that we still don't understand. Um, okay, that's it. Okay, uh, I want to make uh Three points. Uh, uh, thanks for, uh, by the way, Gibbons and, and uh, Francine for, for uh, their review. Uh, I will, uh, the first point will be sort of a, a brief uh, statement by me on where we are. Uh, the second point will be about uh, my view on the empirical work that I advertised. And, uh, and then say something about the future. So. Uh, this is the, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, <laughs> version. Uh, but, uh, no, I, will be, I want to be, I was reading the reverse order. I start with the ugly, which is on my own book. Uh, the <laughs> uh, I just want to continue, so to speak, where I, that's where I came from, thinking pay for performance was important. I just want to say, I think we have gone from the view of pay for performance, analyzing explicit contracts, very much to understanding that when we talk about contracts within the firm or, or incentives within the firm, uh, it is really about almost everything else but uh, pay for performance. Pay for performance is a very small part. So in a way, you can say that the firm is sort of set up really uh, to provide alternative forms of incentives, cheaper forms of incentives than what you would have with, uh, with uh, pay-for-performance contracts, explicit contracts. 
That incidentally does not mean that all the work on explicit pay for performance contracts, multitasking and so on is irrelevant because it's explicit incentives. I take a very different view of uh, we are looking at the logic of the model, the instruments happen, whether it's pay for performance directly in some instances or whether it's all sorts of other incentive drivers, sometimes asset ownership, sometimes praise, uh, sometimes uh, other rewards. Uh, it doesn't change necessarily the multitasking aspect uh, as much as one might. Multitasking is a separate problem from how you deal with it in terms of instruments. So uh, the multitasking view, uh, Oliver sort of told about how, what changed his work. I would say the multitasking thing really did change uh, my uh, view of incentives and it led, and uh, it led into, you know, uh, into the question about how to balance incentives uh, rather than you know, how to provide incentive levels of incentives. And uh, sometimes you hear, and, and uh, Bob <coughs> likes to emphasize uh, this aspect, that it is like uh, Steve Coe's article on, on you, you uh, is it you get what you pay for, or, or uh, whatever the heading was of his article. That, uh, that's kind of the essence of the story, because he lists all these examples about problems uh, that are caused by too powerful explicit pay for performance incentives. And we have, of course, had the Wells Fargo scandal, we had the Enron scandal, we have, we have had a lot of scandals. Uh, uh, the, the, the teacher scandals, uh, I didn't even know about all those, but Atlanta had a big, big scandal. People went into jail because they corrected the students' exams. So very powerful incentives of focusing on performance very strongly lead people eventually to what is a multitasking problem in a way that is the, the, ta the new task that appears if it's strong enough is that you start cheating in one form or another. It's a latent task that you wake up by having very powerful uh, incentives. So uh, uh, that, that uh, the core article did talk about this. But what economics, I think this multitasking stuff led really importantly, and it was emphasized by Bob in his slide, what it led to is the interesting part. It wasn't the multitasking part that is in some sense the most interesting in the sense that, uh, you know, Core already saw it. But it is what, what do firms do about it? Or what, do, what have uh, agents in the economy found as solutions to this problem? And my answer here, or my answer with Milgram was that they use, as I said, other instruments. So it is the instrument part that I, to me is the interesting, interesting aspect of the multitasking uh, 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 story in the context of the firm. So what you see is that they are using a lot of other instruments which is uh, substitutes from the mo for the pay for performance incentives. And, uh, and basically they are, they are, A, the first thing is to have low powered incentives in order to pay for performance incentives. And then substitutes are what Gibbons talked about, job design, very important. I mean, look at an empirical piece of evidence that's really powerful. It may be changing now, but if you work for firm A, you don't work for firm B if you are an employee. That's, the, that's a given. We don't even talk about it. But this is like a 99% true statement. So that's pretty damn powerful evidence that, uh, I, I, you know, it's hard to risk. And, and the firm controls workers in a variety of ways. They define their tasks, they set the rules of the game, they do all sorts of things that are extraordinarily restrictive. So Google advertises when you get 20% time to think for yourself. That means 80% of the time you think what we want you to think about. <laughs> and uh, and that's, not, that's another way of advertising. It. But the <laughs> fact that they advertise at the 20% means it's very rare. And indeed, people have written about it, how remarkable it is. I mean, we, by the way, are on the 100% rule, more or less. So we are quite a unique profession and should be very grateful for that. Incidentally, Google ran into problems with the 20%. I don't know how many of you heard about the Lewandowski scandal, but he set, set up a firm on his 20% time and started selling to Google his services. And you know, Google was sort of, shh, we don't talk about this because he's actually a smart guy and we need him and so on, but the guy used his human capital to actually sell a lot of stuff eventually on the self-driving uh, class. 
And eventually this exploded and now there's a big suit and so on because he stole a lot of stuff from Google allegedly when he went to, I think, Facebook or somewhere else. But the see, they were struggling, so this is of relevance for our stories. You know, they struggled with this idea of not letting him do what he wanted and then it sort of got out of hands and they run into trouble. And you see IBM and other firms actually taking, for, taking workers back into the office. And the argument is not that you know, they should talk to each other. The argument, we can control them better. So controlling the worker is a very big part of you know, deciding whether you want to integrate or not. That's, the, that's an alternative argument for why firms have boundaries in a particular way, is that they actually want to control the activities more strongly, broadly construed. <coughs> And they don't want to run into common agency problems like Uber. Uber is all the time struggling with this thing. They'd like to control the drivers, but they ca if they control them directly and say you can only drive for Uber, then they, are a f they are, then they are employees. So they are just treading that very narrow boundary, and I bet they will eventually be called employees, and they will lose, because it's favorable for them in terms of regulatory dimensions. So that's the... That's, the, that's an alternative theory of the firm in terms of, uh, of uh, I, and by the way, control rights, of course, um, incomplete contracting and the ownership of assets is part of what gets you the control and why you can set the rules of the game. You can think about your own, own childhood, the guy with the field and the basketball and the, the bat and so on, uh, you know, sort of set the rules of the game. So that's, the, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, in terms of, of, so the empirical evidence, I mean, a lot has happened beyond this, but uh, Bob covered some of this. This is, this is uh, I stopped, you realize I stopped working on this topic 20 years ago. So uh, this, is, uh, this is how far I have come. But I think this is highly relevant for looking forward. But between that, I want to say a word about empirical work. Do we ask the question ever, let's test price theory? I don't think we ask those questions. Then what would it mean even to say test the price theory? Price theory is a huge conceptual uh, you know, framework in which we can think about things. But we do hear things like we are testing incomplete contract theory. I think that's just the wrong mindset. Or you know, we are testing multitasking. It's the wrong mindset because multitasking is almost like price theory, but with costly you know, prices in terms of incentives. So I think we really need to, or you really need to, because I'm not going to do anything in this field. <laughs> uh, you, know, you really need to sort of reset your, you know, what is the concept you are looking at. So that's my first point on empirical. The second point is, and this shows that I'm getting older, you know, I think, I think that uh, we are testing the logic of the models. And the logic, like, say, we are not, what I don't like particularly setting up a complete model and sort of saying that, you know, I'm testing a whole model on a particular set of data, you know, somewhere in Kenya or something like that. I think the question to me is where is a certain logic that seems persuasive, like multitasking or take even a better case, Lemon's problem. I mean, brilliant theory, simple, you know, it is true, is my point. It's just a question of where is it, what is its domain of truth? Not you know whether it's true or not. It's massively true, but where are there? Where are the boundaries, and and how are it possible to apply? I think the multitasking, the incomplete contracting, falls in this same category of things. You know what? Where is it useful to think in these terms? And so I'm rather allergic to this testing, because I think we have a false view of our profession. And that is that we are some kind of natural scientists. You know, it's one thing to test whether the light bends around the sun exactly the way Einstein said, because it's always going to bend that way, pretty much. So either it's true or it's not true. But we have such a heterogeneous set of contexts that, you know, we got to sort of somehow deal with that richness in a different way of, uh, or in a different language than uh, you know, saying that we are testing something. So uh, this is meant to be provocative. <laughs> and it's meant, it's meant to be ill-informed. 
<laughs> but I, 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 I do think there's something to what I'm saying. That is, uh, this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that I have been carrying on for 20 years. When, when you get the Nobel Prize, you get to say these things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, so uh, that's what I'm... So on the future contracts, uh, let me just say one thing that I think is exciting is, is we, and it's very much like Oliver said, what really motivates people? This is coming, you know, I thought a lot about it. It's certainly not just money. I don't, uh, Oliver used exactly the right word, you know, this non-instrumental things. Uh, people want to be appreciated. That much we know. And uh, a lot of the way the firm substitutes, what the firm substitutes for explicit incentives inside the firm is that they have the ear of the worker. You just change the accounting system, no pay changes, the workers change. Why? Because they know that the boss is now looking at these numbers as important. So they want to please. And it shows in every survey that you do, like on Nokia, we did every year surveys, you always see the people saying, we would like to know what our, my boss, I would like to know what my boss wants out of me. Because they want to please, they want to be appreciated. Some is very instrumental, they want to get promoted and so on. I think some of it is just not instrumental. You just want to feel happy about it, uh, that other people, you know, like you. So could I have a r round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Sure. Thank you. Now, the first time I smiled, by the way, during this talk. <laughs> uh, the, that leads to the question, what is your audience? Who are you performing for? When you are a child, you perform for your parents. When you go to school, you perform for your teachers and maybe your peers. When you get into work, you perform for your bosses. Just to leave you with a thought, who are you performing for? Ask yourself that question. What are your audiences? And that will tell you something about you know, why we behave the way we behave. But one thing I say, what is the difference between universities and firms in the traditional sense is we don't care about our bosses, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't really care what the president thinks about me, frankly. Because he sets the salaries based on what my peers think about me. So we perform for our peers, and that makes a university a very different setup and, and running in a very different way than a firm, not to mention an army. If you ever gone to an army, you know who you are performing for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because otherwise you don't go home for the weekends. And that's the only thing that matters. So I think looking into this, uh, this setting about uh, performance, and I know I'm seeing seeing uh, Tore there, and I know he agrees with me on this point because he's actually written on this matter, interesting papers. And uh, I think that is one of many interesting ways in which to go in terms of thinking just about motivation, incentives, and, uh, and inside the firm. And this is, not, this is meant to be very complementary to what Oliver is doing, which I think of mainly as about outside the firm. That is how boundaries influence the the sort of strategic game, this is how boundaries influence what happens inside the firm. Thank you very much. On this last point, I should just, uh, okay. I fully agree with what uh, Ben's saying. In fact, every year, one of my jobs as a mentor to junior faculty and to my, to my graduate students, I always tell them who your audience is. And in some sense, the reason I just re-emphasize that is one of the roles of our society as, as SOE is to, in fact, find your audience. And for, your, for the junior colleagues here, you want to think about who you're writing for. And I've often had people coming and say, well, this, isn't this an interesting problem? I say, yes, an interesting problem, except that you're the only person in the world who's interested in it. And that's going to be a problem when we you know, decide to, whether we're going to promote you or not. So it is extremely important to choose your audience, and this is the role of our society. What I'll do now, I guess we, we're sort of short of time, so I think we'll start with some q and A. I I think, and Bernard said he, he had some questions as, as the guy let us off, and so I'll start with Bernard with some questions, and then we'll open up the floor for questions for our, our panelists for just a few minutes, because we are we're a little bit over. Okay, Bernard. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for wonderfully exciting, exciting remarks. So I'll start by one remark on my own. 
So then you were not only provocative, you were personally offensive because I did write at least one survey called Testing Contract Theory. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't apologize, but I will explain that what it's, it's a very bad shortcut, and now I regret using this title. But what we do is that we test an implication of contract theory when we do this kind of work, whether it's Francine or myself or anybody else, in addition to some auxiliary assumptions. And when you want us to measure uh, the domain of application of the Lemons model or anything else, that's actually similar. So the, the way we use shortcuts to designate what we do, but it's actually, I think actually there's not that much difference. But anyway, I leave it there. I'm really not offended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second thing I wanted to say, so Oliver mentioned for the first time in this panel, behavior, rationality, if you want to call it that, or deviations from our uh, standard model. Um, so I think they're especially important for startups, and some of your examples are, were speaking to that. One thing that we don't incorporate very much and that has been found in empirical work is uh, the overconfidence or differences in beliefs between different people. And maybe that also speaks to uh, the desire, non non-instrumental maybe or semi-instrumental desire for taking control, which is just that you think you might do a better job. We know that 90% of entrepreneurs fail, but 100% thought they would become rich. And there's a lot of direct evidence of their perceptions being widely optimistic. So I would like to have your feedback on this. Well, Yes, I, I understand that, uh, you know, you say testing and, and, you know, to get concreteness to things. I have written an empirical paper and I refuse to do it this way and uh, with Baker and Gibbs and, uh, and I now appreciate more. But I think that affects the mindset. You know, it's like if you choose a language, eventually it changes the way you think. It's not just the convenience. It actually changes what you think about. And so that's why I gave this warning. It's not that I don't understand that, uh, that you know, this is sort of makes it more specific. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm big on sort of, I'm updating my beliefs about the relevance, say, of the Lemons problem, but you can bring a thousand tests that show that the Lemons problem is not relevant. And <laughs> I'm still going to think this is a brilliant way of thinking about uh, organizing some of the thinking about the world. That's what I have in mind with theory. It helps me see. So physics has string theory, and some people say it can't be tested. But that in the same breath, they say it's an incredibly useful way of thinking about the world. How can you have something like that? And I think this is the answer. You know, you can have theories that <laughs> sort of can't be tested in some narrow sense, but are very useful ways of thinking, and I think Oliver's stuff is extremely useful in this sense, and, uh, and I hope some of the stuff I've done is useful in this sense. Well, if I can just say a word about the uh, second point. I think um, w we need to depart from rationality in many ways, and I think that understanding this kind of different views of the world um, situation and, and what the implications for it is, is um, is important and useful. I mean, you know, in a classical world, we would pool our information. Uh, you know, kind of, we would agree, um, we wouldn't agree to disagree, okay? Because after we've pooled all our information and we do all the Bayesian stuff, we would agree. And then it wouldn't matter, unless they're private benefits, of course, uh, it wouldn't matter whether you make the decision or I make the decision. Now, I, I'm not denying that private benefits are important. Sometimes they are, but I also think, along with you know, I think the long lines you were saying, that sometimes at the end of it, it's just we have different views, and I would like my view to be implemented, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is if I have control, and that's one of the reasons, and particularly if it was my idea in the first place. I think you know, understanding entrepreneurship, it seems to me intuitively, I don't know, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur, and I don't know that many entrepreneurs, <laughs> but. Uh, I know it is true with our work. 
You know, if you have an idea for a paper, you want to be able to pursue it. You wouldn't want, uh, I mean, you might bring on a co-author co and share some control with them. That's fine if you think they're going to contribute to the project. But you're not really going to be keen to give up the whole thing to them if you're really keen on the idea. You want to see it through to um, its conclusion. And I think that must be true of entrepreneurs who have ideas. And um, so there, the, you know, being, implement, being able to implement your own vision, even absent any obvious private benefits of the classical kind, it is probably going to be important and is it going to drive a lot of things. But I think for econo it's, it's difficult for, you know, economists always want to be able to measure things in terms of, and, and, you know, if you can't measure things in terms of money somehow, they, they often think, oh dear, that's not for us. But I think it should be for us because I think it, it could be of first order importance. Okay, well, I think, I think we're almost uh, time for lunch, and I would like to thank our distinguished, all four of our extremely distinguished, and extremely, extremely distinguished uh, Tudor Prizes for their work. Thank you very much. <laughs>